Welcome to ICA. We miss you, but until then, please stay safe at home. Anyway, here are some important announcements that you need to know. We have children's church material available for your kids, so you can download it at bit.ly slash ICA Kids Online. We hope you and your child can have a great experience and encounter God together. Follow ICA Kids on Instagram to get the latest updates from ICA Kids. ICA Prayer Service is going stronger on Zoom every Tuesday at 6.30 to 7.30 p.m. You can check our Instagram on Tuesday and get the meeting ID and let us be strengthened by praying together. There's power in prayer. If you have things to be prayed for, reach out to us through bit.ly slash ICA Prayer Online. Our pastors and ICA Prayer team will pray for you. Friends, we provide a new way for you to donate online to the ministry at ICA. You can scan the QR code on the screen. Or just visit icsby.com slash giving for more information. Have you followed ICA on social media and subscribed to ICA channel? We've prepared devotion, recipes, and more interesting content and updates to accompany you during the quarantine. Because physical distancing is not spiritual distancing. ICA Keep Focus We are starting a new Bible reading plan to keep you focused until the end of the year. You can just go to the link on our slide or simply scan the QR code to get started. And follow us on social media to get more information. Alright ICA, those are the important announcements that you need to know. And by the way, this is actually what happened behind the scene. Alright, we love to serve God and serve you. So let's enjoy the worship and just bring your heart. My chains are gone 
shall soon dissolve like snow. The sun forbear to shine, but God, you called me here below, will be forever.
at the center of it all. Jesus at the center of it all. From beginning to the end, it will always be, it's always been you, Jesus. Jesus and nothing else may. You're the center And everything revolves around you Jesus, you At the center of it all You're at the center, God Jesus be the center of my life. Jesus, be the center of my life. From beginning to the end, it will always be, it's always been you.
Lord God, we want to thank you for your presence this morning. God, we pray that today your blessing would reach out to every house, every screen, every person that's watching, that you would speak to their hearts, God. As we begin to study your word together, we pray you would open our hearts to hear the things that you would say to us. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, good morning. This is uh, Pastor JV. I'm excited that you've chosen to join us today for worship here at ICA. We're going to dive into the scripture today and hope that um, I don't turn into a snowman uh, before it's done. We're in the middle of a series right now called The League of Kings. If you've missed any of the rest of our series, you can find our podcast on our website, icasby.com, or you can go check out our YouTube channel uh, to catch up on some of the past events. This morning we're going to be studying the life of a young king named Joash. Now why do we study the lives of these kings? Well, the Bible is filled with the stories of human beings like you and I that went through life. Uh, They were faced with challenges, they were faced with temptations, they were faced with pressure, and they made good and bad decisions. And as we study their lives, we can apply the lessons that they have gone through to ourselves. You know, it's always better to learn from the mistakes and failures of others than it is to make those same mistakes ourselves. And when we see the successes of others, we can try to model those. And so there are pertinent things that we can learn from the lives of these kings. The other interesting aspect of this is that the lives of the kings of Israel give us insight into questions of power and politics. All of us in life will deal with politics. Um, All of us will deal with authority. We will be under the authorities of others at times, whether it's in our family, in our job, or in as a citizen of a nation. Uh, and at times we will be put into positions of authority. And we can see how power and authority affected others. Uh, we can learn uh, from the dangers that they faced, and we can learn also from their successes. And so as we study the League of Kings, these are some of the lessons we're hoping to pull and apply in our own lives. You know, History warns us that the desire for power or sin and wickedness have brought down many who otherwise would have been destined for greatness. You know, in 1857, there was a British Lord, his name was Lord Acton, and in a letter he wrote to an Anglican minister, he penned these words that have become pretty famous. He said, power tends to corrupt, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Great men are almost always bad men. Now this is a pretty pessimistic view, but sadly when you look at the history of world leaders, it doesn't always fill us with hope that the best and most noble and righteous always rise to the top. And that was what Lord Acton was saying, is that power was a corrupting influence upon men. The mantle of power often brings out of us things within our character that we did not realize were there. J.R.R. Tolkien, when he wrote The Lord of the Rings, kind of symbolized this idea in the ring of power, if you've ever seen uh, those movies. And you can see that this thing of power um, had a seducing effect on people. It drew them, but it also twisted and corrupted them. Now, Frank Herbert, who is the author of the Dune series, had this interesting quote. He said, all governments suffer a recurring problem. Power attracts pathological personalities. It is not that power corrupts, but that it is magnetic to the corruptible. Such people have a tendency to become drunk on violence, a condition to which they are quickly addicted. George Washington, the first president of the United States, said this, Government is not reason. It is not eloquence. It is force. And like fire... It is a dangerous servant and a fearful master. So, you know, as we look at this and we look at the history of the world and what men who have had power have done, you know, we kind of hope, well, where could we find a truly good and just example of people who are in authority? And, you know, I always thought, well, when I first picked up the Bible, I thought, surely when I read about the kingdom that God has set up, You know, when he put David on the throne in Israel and God established a kingdom on earth, that this would be the absolute example of goodness and justice. And yet the reality is, is even the kingdom that God set up, he entrusted to human beings. And all of us as human beings are uh, prone to the same sins and the same faults. And so we see that he entrusts things to us, 
but it's up to us how we carry out that stewardship. This is true whether it is of the kingdom of God or whether it is of our church or whether it's the a family that you are the a parent of. Is God has entrusted you with a position, often a position of leadership and authority, but it is going to be up to you and I what we do with that trust. Now, God gives guidance, and he gave guidance to the ancient kings of Israel as well. In fact, in Deuteronomy 17, 18 through 20, God said this. He says, when the king takes the throne of his kingdom, he is to write for himself on a scroll a copy of this law, the law that God had given to Moses taken from that of the Levitical priests. It is to be with him and he is to read it all the days of his life so that he may learn to revere the Lord his God and follow carefully all the words of this law and these decrees and not consider himself better than his fellow Israelites and turn from the law to the right or to the left. Then he and his descendants will reign a long time over his kingdom in Israel. So God gives us advice over and over in scripture that we are to watch over our own lives and he's given us his word as a compass if you will to show us what is the right way and what is the wrong way. He told the kings at this time that they needed to have the law near them to study it so that they would know the right course that they should take. And we see over and over that those that did this and walked with God, that he blessed and prospered them, and that those that turned away from this often found ruin. In the New Testament, the Apostle Peter warns us in 2 Peter 3, 17 through 18, he says, Dear friends, since you have been forewarned, be on your guard so that you may not be carried away by the error of the lawless and fall from your secure position but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be glory, both now and forever. In 1 Timothy 4.16, he says, Watch your life and doctrine closely. Persevere in them, because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. And this is something that we also see with the lives of the kings. Those that stuck close to God not only preserved themselves and their own families, but they brought blessing to all of those that were under them. And those that departed from God not only brought ruin upon themselves, but ruin upon the nations over which they were overseers. And so as we dive into our king that we're going to study, the story of this King Joash, it is a tragic tale. Uh, it is a tragic tale of two families. And it is a story that, uh, you know, g gave me concern, you know, when I first started reading the Kings, when I was young, when I picked up my Bible for the first time as a kid and I was reading, one of the things that jumped out at me was how many people in the Bible would start well, they would be given this great beginning, uh, they would be serving God in their youth, and at some point uh, they turned away and they turned into darkness and ruin and brought destruction on themselves. And I remember uh, as a young person thinking, Lord, it would be far better for me to have started poorly and to end well than it would be to start well, loving you and knowing you, and then for some reason, uh, because I did not keep watch over my heart, to slip into sin and darkness in the end. And so God gives us this warning, the same warning he gave uh, the kings of Israel, is to watch over and guard our hearts so that these mistakes don't happen to us. So we're going to dive into the story of Joash, and our story begins in 2 Chronicles 21, verse 1, and it says, Then Jehoshaphat rested with his ancestors and was buried with them in the city of David. And Jehoram, his son, succeeded him as king. So Jehoshaphat was a king that we studied a couple of weeks ago. If you want to go back and check that out, do that on our podcast or um, on our YouTube channel. And he was a good and a righteous king. It says that his son Jehoram succeeded him. In 2 Chronicles 21 verse 4, it says, When Jehoram established himself firmly over his father's kingdom, he put all his brothers to the sword along with some of the officials of Israel. Jehoram will not follow in the good footsteps of his father Jehoshaphat. He becomes an evil king. And we start with him because this is going to lay some uh, background as to what shapes this young man, Joash. The nation of Israel under King David and Solomon had been divided. And so the southern 
half was just the tribe of Judah. That was David's tribe. And uh, they continued to have kings after the line of David there. And all the other tribes went north. And in the north, there was an evil king named Omni, and he turned away from the worship of God. He established his uh, capital in the city of Samaria, and he had a son. His son was named Ahab. Now, Ahab was a weak king. Uh, He wasn't a a strong personality, and he married a woman who was the daughter of the king of Tyre. She was a Phoenician, and her name was Jezebel. Now, Jezebel is one of those famous names in the Bible. So she comes from Phoenicia. She does not serve the God of Israel. Now, Now, God had warned the kings not to do this, not to intermarry with the nations around them who served other gods. In Exodus 34, 15, it says, be careful not to make a treaty with those who live in the land For when they prostitute themselves to their gods and sacrifice to them, they will invite you and you will eat their sacrifices. And when you choose some of their daughters as wives for your sons, and those daughters prostitute themselves to their gods, they will lead your sons to do the same. God was giving a warning that the close relationships in the lives of the people of Israel needed to be those that shared their values and would push them towards God. That if we bring into our lives close intimate relationships with those that are heading a different direction, it's often gonna pull us a different direction. Uh, The Apostle Paul spoke about this in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14 through 18. He says, do not be yoked together with unbelievers. Now, it's an odd term, but a yoke was a, a, a bar that would be placed across the backs of two oxen when they pulled a plow and it and it bonded them together and so if you had two oxen that were of the same strength going the same direction they would pull the plow straight but if you put a donkey and an ox together then the oxen would be going this way the donkey wouldn't be would be going a different way or not be able to pull as well and the the plow would plow in a crooked fashion and so this language is used He says, don't bind yourself together. If you're looking to date somebody and you have an idea of marrying them, uh, if you're choosing the people who are your closest, the most personal friends, ask that question. Is this a person that shares my belief in God and my values in God? Are they going to push me closer to God? Or is this a person that spiritually is going to be going a different direction uh, than I am? Scripture says in 2 Corinthians 6, 14, what does righteousness and wickedness have in common? You know, how can we build a house if we don't have the core foundation in common? It says, what fellowship does light have with darkness? What harmony is there between Christ and Satan? For what does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? What agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will live with them and walk among them and I will be their God and they will be my people. Therefore, come out from them and be separate, says the Lord. Touch no unclean thing and I will receive you. I will be a father to you. You will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Now, you know, God is not saying that we cannot, you know, care about, be friends with uh, people that Uh, are in the world or that believe differently than we do, but he is talking about the intimate, close, personal relationships, the the people who have the strongest influence in your life. Are they pushing you towards God or away? Um, People that you want to date, people that you're going to marry, is that built on God or is it not? And he warned these kings, if you bind yourself in that way, you're going to find that they lead you astray. Well, this is exactly what happens to Ahab. Jezebel comes over. Now Jezebel, her name actually means where is Baal? Now Baal is the god of the Sidonians and her name was a cry, a ritual cry to summon uh, Baal from the underworld. That was literally what her name meant. You know, just as a uh, an aside here, if you're dating somebody whose name literally is a cry to summon uh, Satan from the underworld, you might want to reconsider Uh, that relationship. That's just free advice there. And so this is who she was. She comes over and Ahab, you know, was kind of a weak willed king, but Jezebel was a very ambitious person. And so she quickly used her husband's power to gain her own power there in that kingdom. 
uh, for her since she was a Sidonian, he built an altar to the god Baal in Israel, even though this was against the commandments of God. He gave her a place for her to worship her own gods. And she also became the high priestess of Asherah, who was another goddess that was a consort for Baal. And she grew in power in the land of the northern tribes of Israel uh, until she instituted a persecution against the prophets of God. And so she had the prophets of God put to death. There was a massive persecution and she spread the worship of Baal throughout that land. If you read in the Bible, uh, the figure Elijah, Elijah comes into conflict with Ahab over this persecution of the prophets of God by Ahab and his wife Jezebel. Now, to get back to Judah, so why does that all matter for us here in Judah? Well, Jehoram, who is a wicked king now, he hasn't followed in his father's footsteps, marries a young woman named Atalia. Now, who is she? She was the daughter of Jezebel. So he intermarries with the daughter of Jezebel from the northern kingdom of Israel. Now this comes into Judah. And the same wickedness that was spreading through that northern kingdom comes down now here into Judah and through Atalia begins to be spread among the people of Judah. Because of his wickedness, God brings judgment against him. It says as a part of God's judgment, uh, the Philistines and the Arabs attacked Judah. They carried off all of the goods from the king's palace and they carried off almost all of his sons except for one. One son, a young man named Ahaziah. And Jehoram himself was judged by God to where he died, where his intestines would come out of his body. And this is a pretty horrible way to go. Um, this is one of the reasons we didn't do a whole series just on Jehoram, is that we thought that the artwork for the slides might be a little too gruesome. Uh, but this is what happens. While God entrusts stewardship to these kings, he also holds them accountable for their actions and their wickedness. So he judges Jehoram, and his youngest son, Ahaziah, is now put on the throne. So Ahaziah becomes king now over Judah. And it says that he also became wicked. In 2 Chronicles 22, 3 and 4, it says, He too followed the ways of the house of Ahab, for his mother encouraged him to act wickedly. What a terrible thing to have a parent who is encouraging their child in doing evil. It says he did evil in the eyes of the Lord as the house of Ahab had done for after his father's death they became his advisors to his undoing. We're going to just talk about advisors a little later. At this point judgment is going to come upon the house of Ahab. God prophecies to Ahab that he is going to bring judgment against his entire house and God raises up this general named Jehu who accomplishes this. Jehu charges in and puts to death everyone in the house of Ahab. Jezebel herself will be thrown from the top of her palace. She will uh, be put to death that way. Dogs in the street will devour her and this young man Ahaziah will be unfortunate enough to have been in the northern kingdom visiting during this time. Jehu will find him and put him to death as well. So God brings judgment in the end against the entirety of the house of Ahab. Now when this happens, Atalia, the daughter of Jezebel, remains there in Judah. Her son has been put to death. Her entire family line has been put to death. And all she has left is her grandchildren of her line. And so what does she do? Well, she does what any caring and loving grandmother would do. It says that she put to death all of her grandsons so that no one else could have a claim to the throne while she herself seized power. Second Chronicles 22:10. When Atalia, the mother of Ahaziah, saw that her son was dead, she proceeded to destroy the whole royal family of the house of Judah. Now, I want to pause here for a second because, you know, this seems so implausible. I think for most normal people, we can't imagine, you know, any grandmother putting to death her own grandchildren or why anybody would desire power and authority so much more than the love of their own family. And I think because it's hard for us to grasp, it's hard for us to sometimes realize that there's people out there that think that way. Um, but sadly, world history is filled with examples that Italia is not necessarily that unusual. You know, the 20th century 
saw the rise of communism around the world, you know, whether in the Soviet Union, in China, and in Cambodia. And, you know, with it came men who promised a, uh, a, a system of utopia and equity, uh, but in order to accomplish their brave new world, they ended up putting to death hundreds of millions of people. And so, um, you know, it is good for us to understand uh, that that mindset is out there. And when we select leaders or when we enter into leadership, to keep in mind the effect that power can have on human beings. You know, so this is the background that's gonna lead us to this character, Joash. This is the world uh, that he is in. And if you think that there's some dysfunction in your life or your family, uh, you know, here's, here's the Bible uh, showing you what real dysfunction can look like. It says in 2 Chronicles 20 to 11, but, Jehosheba, the daughter of King Jehoram, took Joash, son of Ahaziah, and stole him away from among the royal princes who were about to be murdered, and put him and his nurse in a bedroom. Because Jehosheba, the daughter of King Jehoram, and wife of the priest Jehoiada, was Ahaziah's sister. She hid the child from Atalia, so she could not kill him. And he remained hidden with them at the temple of God for six years while Atalia ruled the land. Joash, who is just a one-year-old little boy, is rescued by his father's sister. Her husband is the priest in the temple. They take that baby, they put him into the temple, and he is raised there for six years. And you can imagine the life of young Joash. He never gets to go outside. Uh, he's hidden away from the world to protect his very life. Jehoiada, the husband of Jehoshaphat, both of them take their lives into their own hands in order to do the right thing and save the life of this little boy. Also to preserve the line of King David that God promised would be on that throne. So they rescue him. Atalia becomes the queen mother. She has no other contestants to the throne and she governs and she spreads the worship of Baal and Asherah throughout the land of Judah. Now, after six years, this man, Jehoiada, is going to move to put the true king on the throne. We read in 2 Chronicles 23, 1, it says, in the seventh year, Jehoiada showed his strength. Some verses say he strengthened himself. You know, in order to stand for God in times when earthly powers oppose God, we too will have to have courage. Doing the right thing takes courage. It would have been much easier for Jehoiada to sit back and do nothing, but he encourages himself, he strengthens himself, and he acts. It says, he made a covenant with the commanders of units of a hundred. They went throughout Judah and gathered the Levites and the heads of the Israelite families from all of the towns. And when they came to Jerusalem, the whole assembly made a covenant with the king at the temple of God. Jehoiada said to them, the king's son shall reign as the Lord promised concerning the descendants of David. In verse 11, it says, Jehoiada and his sons brought out the king's son and put the crown on him. They presented him with a copy of the covenant and proclaimed him king. They anointed him and shouted, long live the king. We can see here that Jehoiada, as he sets up the king, he tries to set up this kingdom based on the laws and the principle of God. He takes the king and he gives him a copy of the law. It says, when Atalia heard the noise, of the people running and cheering the king, she went to them at the temple of the Lord. She looked and there was the king standing by his pillar at the entrance. The officers and the trumpeters were beside the king and all the people of the land were rejoicing and blowing trumpets and musicians with their instruments were leading the praises. Then Atalia tore her robes and shouted, treason, treason. Jehoiada the priest sent out the commanders of units of a hundred who were in charge of the troops and said to them, bring her out between the ranks and put to the sword anyone who follows her. For the priest had said, do not put her to death at the temple of the Lord. So they seized her as she reached the entrance of the horse gate on the palace grounds and there they put her to death. So the evil reign of Atalia was ended and the true king is placed on the throne by Jehoiada. And here we have a time of repentance 
and a removing of evil. It says in 2 Chronicles 23:16, Jehoiada then made a covenant that he, the people, and the king would be the Lord's people. All the people went to the temple of Baal and tore it down. 2 Chronicles 23:20 20 says, They went into the palace through the upper gate and seated the king on the royal throne. All the people of the land rejoiced, and the city was calm because Atalia had been slain with the sword. So we see here now that as they place the king on the throne, there's something else that happens. Before the king is placed on the throne, they go and they tear down the temple to Baal that is in the city. For us as well, you know, we want God to come and to dwell in our hearts. We want the Lord to be involved in our lives. But one of the things we have to ask ourselves is, are we willing to tear down those things in our own life that are against God or that are destructive to God? You know, have we searched our own hearts to see, Lord, what are the idols in my life? Is there sin in my life? Is there something that's keeping you uh, from the rightful place that you have in my heart? Who is on the throne of my life? As we desire God to be close with us, have we made our hearts a place where he can dwell? Or are there things that we need to get rid of and surrender to the Lord? So at this time, good times begin to come in again to the kingdom of Judah. In 2 Chronicles 24, 1, it says, Joash was seven years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem for 40 years. He is going to have a long reign. Uh, he starts as a young man, uh, but he has Jehoiada as his advisor. It says, Joash did what was right in the eyes of the Lord all the years of Jehoiada the priest. So like a good father, Jehoiada does everything in his power to set up Joash to succeed where those before him have failed. He chooses a wife for him that is good and noble instead of the wives that his ancestors had chosen that had led them astray. He teaches him the law of God. Jehoiada does everything to set Joash on a good path and to avoid the errors of his family. And we see that Joash does head down on a good path. And one of the first things he does is restore the temple. In 2 Chronicles 24 verse 4 it says, Sometime later Joash decided to restore the temple of the Lord. The temple had fallen into disrepair during the time of Atalia. In verse 8 it said, At the king's command a chest was made and placed outside at the gate of the temple of the Lord. In verse 10, All the officials and all the people brought their contributions gladly dropping them into the chest until it was full. So uh, this may be the first example of the offering box that we see in a lot of churches today, which comes from this king, Joash. He set up a chest, bored a hole into it. People would put their offerings in there to restore and rebuild the temple of God. And it says something interesting. It says, they rebuilt the temple. In verse 14, it says, when they had finished, they brought the rest of the money to the king and to Jehoiada. With it were made articles for the Lord's temple, articles for the service, for the offerings, the dishes, the other objects of gold. As long as Jehoiada lived, burnt offerings were presented continually in the temple of God. So what we begin to see here now is a restoration of those things that were lost. If we remember during the time of King Jehoram, outside armies came in and they stole out of the land all of these things, the objects in the palaces and the house of God, and yet now uh, these things are being restored and rebuilt. We can see this as a lesson in our own life. Jesus says the devil comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Although he may lure us into a life of sin by promising us things, they're empty promises. And in the end, what we have is often sorrow and regret and a loss of many of the good things that we had wanted. But if we also will repent, turn from our sins, and turn back to God, God will not only forgive, but the Bible says that he will restore us. It says in 1 John that God is faithful and just not only to forgive our sins, but to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God is one who wants to restore our lives. And we see that here in the life of Judah, that when they turned away from their sin and their wickedness back to God, he begins to restore his favor and his blessings on them. He says in 2 Chronicles 24, 2, Joash did what was right in the eyes of the Lord all the years of Jehoiada the priest. And that is something we wanna hang on because that's gonna become important a little later. 2 Chronicles 24, 15 says, Now Jehoiada was 
old and full of years and he died at the age of 130. So he lived a long time, dies at the age of 130. He was buried with the kings in the city of David because of the good he had done in Israel for God and his temple. So this is someone who has given this great honor of being buried in the very place where the kings were. Sadly, at this point, this is where things begin to go sideways. It says in 2 Chronicles 24, 17, after the death of Jehoiada, the officials of Judah came and paid homage to the king. And he listened to them. They abandoned the temple of the Lord, the God of their ancestors, and they worshipped Asherah poles and idols. So how does this happen? How does a guy who is instrumental in restoring a relationship with God to a nation, of tearing down worship of the evil deity Baal, of restoring the temple, for governing for decades, leading people towards God, how does he now at the end turn away? And I think, you know, the key here is that he listened to these advisors. Now, who were these? These were the officials of the land. These were the same kinds of people that had enticed his grandfather Jehoram or his father. They are the kinds of people who, when the country starts going a good direction, they hide in the shadows and they wait until there's a moment of weakness in the king, a moment when they can come in and try to influence those who are maybe shaky in their convictions. And Joash apparently was shaky in his convictions. Now, how can that be? It seems that when we look at Joash, this is a man who took on the moral character of those who surrounded him. So during the time when Jehoiada was his major influence, he did well. But when Jehoiada was gone and other influences came in, he himself lacked that core value to be able to hang on to what was true. He didn't have his own foundation, but was relying on the foundation of others. And this is a warning to us because many of us without knowing it might be in the same situation as Joash. We have to ask ourselves, is my relationship with God my own? Or is it simply my parents' relationship? Or is it my pastor's relationship? Or my youth pastor's relationship? Do I serve God because I have made that personal commitment to Him and I have grounded that in myself? Or is it simply because the social environment that I'm in happens to be a good one? I know sad stories of young people who, when they had a great youth group around them, were committed to God and loved God and kept their lives in a good direction, but then the moment they went away to university and were outside of that positive influence, suddenly their character was not ready for the challenges and temptations that university was going to offer them. And so this seems to be the case with Joash as well, and it's a warning to us that we ourselves would make sure that our character and our relationship with God is grounded. The other thing it causes us to ask is who are our influences? You know, are we truly influenced by God and by His Word? Do we pray to Him and seek Him so that His values are what fill us? Or are we more influenced by the world around us? Are we influenced by celebrities and by Hollywood and by media and by musicians? And the world, in its rebellion against God, is the world telling us what values we should have? Is the world the one that we listen to as to how we should think about one issue or another? Or is our foundation truly built on Christ. Joash was a person who took on the character of those around him, and it led to his ruin. Now, God loves Joash, and he reaches out to him, and he tries to draw him back. He sends prophets to him to warn him, and he rejects them. And so God now decides, I will send someone that Joash might listen to. I will send someone close to him. I will send a brother. It says in 2 Chronicles 24, verse 20, Then the Spirit of the Lord came on Zechariah, the son of Jehoiada, the priest. Remember, Jehoiada was like a father to Joash. Joash's entire life was raised by Jehoiada and his wife. And so Joash would have known Zechariah during that entire time like a brother. Not just during the six years that he grew up in the temple, but during the entirety of his reign when Jehoiada uh, guided him and counseled him and supported him. 
as a young king, as a father, Zechariah would have been like a brother. And so Zechariah comes before Joash and before the officials of the land. He stood before the people and said, This is what God says. Why do you disobey the Lord's commands? You will not prosper. Because you have forsaken the Lord, He has forsaken you. But, it says, they plotted against him, and by order of the king, they stoned him to death in the courtyard of the Lord's temple. King Joash did not remember the kindness Zechariah's father Jehoiada had showed him, but killed his son, who said as he lay dying, May the Lord see this and call you to account. You know, evil will turn us into things that we never imagined we could become. It will take us further under its power than we ever thought we might go once we begin to head down that road. Here we see Joash, who basically turns against the only family that he's known because of the wicked influences on his life. Here we see Joash, who murders his, a man who is like his own brother who betrays the Jehoiada, who was like a father to him. Everything that Joash had was because of the family of Zechariah. This is the very family that rescued Joash from death as a young boy. This is the very family that at the risk of their own lives raised him. This is a family who took great risk upon themselves to place him upon the throne that was rightfully his and had been taken from him. This is the family that stood by him, taught him, counseled him, guided him, and helped him all of his life. And now he turns against them. Joash had lost all gratitude for those that had helped to make him what he was. And this is also a warning for us. Are we aware of the blessings and benefits that we derive from those that went before us? Are we aware of how much we have because of our own parents? Are we aware of what we have because of our grandparents? Are we aware of those people that have helped us to be where we are today? Or are we so focused on ourselves that we don't have gratitude? Do we focus on the failures sometimes of those that went before us instead of looking at the hard work and the effort that they put into our lives? Joash apparently had no gratefulness and he turned against and betrayed the very people that had made him everything. Because of this, God now brings judgment. And what a terrible thing for the Lord the Lord God who had spent all this time protecting Joash as a boy, who through God's servants had put him on the throne of his grandfather David, who had watched over him and under him had brought restoration to this land, had brought back all the blessings that had been taken away because of their turn to wickedness. Now God has to bring accountability to this man. It says in 2 Chronicles 24, 23, at the turn of the year, the army of Aram marched against Joash. It invaded Judah and Jerusalem and killed all the leaders of the people. All those advisors, everyone that had come to Joash and encouraged him to do wickedness, their wicked deeds come back on their own head. He sent all the plunder to their king in Damascus. And although the Aramean army had come with only a few men, the Lord delivered into their hands a much larger army. Because Judah had forsaken the Lord, the God of their ancestors, judgment was executed on Joash. When the Arameans withdrew, they left Joash severely wounded, and his officials conspired against him for murdering the son of Jehoiada the priest. They killed him in his bed. So he died and was buried in the city of David, but not in the tombs of the kings. Here we see this man who had so much potential, who started his life so well, who was used as an instrument to bring about good to a nation, and now he ends in ruin. Jehoiada, who was not a king, was buried in the tombs of the kings. But here, Joash, who should also have been buried with honors, was buried outside of the tombs of his fathers. You know, Proverbs 29.1 says this, whoever remains stiff-necked after many rebukes will suddenly be destroyed without remedy. Now the life of Joash is a warning to us. Are we stubborn in our sin? You know, how long will God reach out to us? How long will he draw us to pull us back from sin before eventually he hands us over to be accountable for our deeds? 
the scripture is warning us when God begins to tug on your heart to lure you away from the brink of doing evil and wrong, that we need to listen to that voice and run to him. If we run to him, he is quick to forgive and restore. But if we persist in our sin, eventually we will be accountable for it. As we close today, I want us to ask this question, are we Jehoiada or are we Joash? Jehoiada was a man who in his generation fought for what was right against all odds. He was a person who had his own relationship with God. His own character was grounded in God. He didn't wait for other people to be the ones to push him to do what was right, but he himself sought the face of God. And because of that, God blessed and established Jehoiada. Or are we Joash? Joash was a person who was given everything by others, and yet in the end, he turned away because he didn't have that deep personal conviction in his own heart. He was able to be swayed by the evil influences of the world around him. As we close, Matthew 16, 26 and 27 says this, Jesus, in speaking to the crowd, said, What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world and yet forfeit their soul? For what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in His Father's glory with His angels, and then He will reward each person according to to what they have done. As we close, we see here that even with the fallibilities of human beings, the purposes of God are going to go forward. God is still going to accomplish His uh, desire and His plans in the world. As we close here, the question we have to ask ourselves is, will we be a Jehoiada or a Joash? Will we be like Jehoiada who lived his life well and ended well, or like Joash who although he started well, ended poorly and lost everything. God's desire for you and I is that we would be a people that turn to him and in our relationship with him not only live well but end well. So today wherever you're at in that place, maybe you're somebody who hasn't even started well, uh, you're somebody who maybe in hearing this wants to have your life right with God, God is calling to you, he's calling to us to come to him it says in the Bible that God has no pleasure uh, in the judgment of the wicked. He has no pleasure in having to bring accountability onto people's lives. He would much rather us receive grace and forgiveness, and he's inviting us to do that. Let's come to him. Let's not be stubborn or uh, stiff-necked and push God away when he's drawing us. And it says that if we will do that, that God will not only forgive, but he will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let's close in prayer. Lord, uh, I just wanna pray today, Father, um, for your blessing and your grace to be on everyone who is out there beyond every screen listening to your message today. Uh, Lord, as we study the life of Jehoiada and Joash, of these two families uh, that live their lives very differently, I pray, God, that you would help us to learn from their successes and help us to learn from their failures. God, we thank you for giving us these examples that we can see so that we don't have to repeat the same mistakes ourselves. And Lord, I pray for everyone who's out there that we would search our own hearts, Lord. Are there idols in our own life that we need to lay down so that you could truly be placed upon the throne of our life? God, um, are there influences in our life that are leading us away from you, Lord, uh, that we need to maybe get away from and find influences in our lives that are gonna put us in a positive direction? And Lord, also the final question is, uh, is our relationship with you truly founded in our own heart and solid and stable, or is it simply riding on the coattails of others? And God, if that is the case, we pray you would come into our lives, Lord. Help us to shake off those things that keep us from you and to be fully grounded in you, Lord. And I pray for your blessing to be on everyone and they would have a great week in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you guys, and we hope you have a fantastic week, and we'll see you again next Sunday. Oh, holy night, the stars are brightly shining. It is the night of our dear Savior's birth. Long lay the world in sin and ever past. And the soul felt its worth A thrill of hope The weary world rejoices For yonder breaks 
Yeah.